There's also some related work with John Stout, who's here. Um, and I should say, for those of you who've seen this either once uh, in New York or even twice, if you're also in Paris, this is a different talk. Uh, you've seen the cartoon level advertisement of the results, perhaps, although some of you have, haven't heard any of it. Um, in this talk, I aim to explain where those results came from in some more depth. So the main idea, the takeaway of the talk, is we're going to explore the landscape of Calabia threefold hypersurfaces at large values of the Hodge number H11. And the status report is that we can now triangulate and obtain the topological data of Calabia threefold anywhere in the kreutzer skarka list in seconds per geometry. That means we have access to a pretty large ensemble of effective theories. And what we find is that when uh, H11 is large, the Kähler cones are narrow, Volumes are large, axions are ultralight, and field ranges are small. Now, uh, as far as motivation, we'd like to learn something about quantum gravity, and one way to go about that is to study ensembles of explicit solutions in a weakly coupled UV completion of quantum gravity, like string theory, weak coupling, and large volume. You can use this as evidence against or for no-go conjectures. Um, and this is generally complementary to more broad brush landscape statistics of the sort that Deneff and Douglas, among others, pioneered some years ago. Uh, here we're trying not to use the thermodynamic description, but find individual microscopic configurations. This can inform questions, as I'll show you, that hinge on having particular topological data in hand. And it might be that we find new mechanisms for moduli stabilization or something else. So we should just look and see what's out there. So the task is, is to generate and characterize a large ensemble of solutions. And one way to do that is to work in a pretty well-controlled regime uh, of type 2b orientifolds uh, on Calab well, type 2b string theory compactified on orientifolds of Calabia threefold. We're going to study Calabia threefold hypersurfaces x. Throughout this talk, x is the threefold uh, in four-dimensional toric varieties v. So this is for complex dimensions. And such toric varieties correspond, as I'll briefly review, to triangulations of four real dimensional reflexive lattice polytopes. So polytopes in z to the four. Um, and Kreutzer and Skark have enumerated all of those. There are about half of a billion of them. And we'll be able to study any of them that we like. So the goal is to generate and study a large ensemble of four dimensional effective theories coming from quantum gravity by analyzing subsets of the Kreutzer Skark list. And this requires some adaptations of existing packages. So if you take publicly available packages, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, you can't really analyze this data in any way. Not only, it's not only a software thing, actually some new mathematical results were needed. So what can we do to build such uh, an ensemble? Here's how the task actually proceeds. You pick a polytope from the list, and you triangulate it, and you examine the triangulation. Um, there are some requirements on what kind of triangulation has to be fine, regular, and star, which basically means that it's sufficiently nice, sufficiently complete. Um, I won't go into that. And once you have a triangulation in hand, uh, which means that you have, so you have a polytope. So here's a two-dimensional polytope. And here's a triangulation of it. It's a subdivision of the polytope into simplices, so triangles, in this case, segments, and points. Once you have a triangulation in hand, you can use uh, the data of the triangulation to read off intersection numbers. So for example, in this case, with the points corresponding to divisors, A, B, C, and D, the way you read this triangulation is because A and B are connected by an edge, the divisors D, A, and D, B intersect in a curve corresponding to this edge. B and C intersect in a curve, A and C intersect in a curve, and those three curves intersect in a point corresponding to this triangle. So it's very easy. Once you have the data in hand, you just start looking at which points are connected by edges, are connected by triangles, are connected by tetrahedra, et cetera. And that information tells you everything you might want to know about topological things, intersection number. Okay. Any questions about this basic underlying thing? That's what I'm going to be using. And the question is, how can you actually progress to the point that you can get a computer to manipulate these triangulations? When you have the intersection numbers, then you have the metric on Kähler moduli space, right? Because the Kähler potential is minus 2 log of Cijk, Ti, Tj, Tk, if uh, this is the set of non-vanishing intersection numbers, and these are the volumes of two cycles. 
So once you know intersection numbers, you know a lot of things about the Kähler moduli sector. Now, if you want to compute the superpotential in addition, you need further topological data, not just intersection numbers. I won't go into that now. I'm happy to chat about it afterward if anyone cares about that. The trouble is the following. The number of points that matter, the number of points that you have to connect by edges, by triangles, and the like, uh, is H11 plus 4. And the number of intersection numbers that you have to examine goes like H11 cubed. And H11 goes up to 491. Not, yes, Murdad. A good question. No, it is not. So um, you can, I could pick a different triangulation in this case with the same labels. I could triangulate like that. And now uh, A and C no longer intersect. And that will change what appears in the volume form in general. It doesn't always change it, but it in general does change it. So what we have to examine is not just um, a triangulation of a polytope, but all the triangulations. Because in principle, every distant, every new triangulation could give a new geometry. And that's why we should study the number, of the, all of the triangulations of these polytopes. The thing is, here, the number of points you have to include is large. The number of intersections numbers is large. That's just for one triangulation. Then there are exponentially many triangulations per polytope, all of which we should, in principle, get some measure for. Okay, so that's the task ahead, and it's it's little little tough. So here's the realm we want to study. Uh, H21 runs up this way, and H11 runs up this way. So this is easy down here, hard up there. And um, there's been a lot of work in this really thin fringe here with H11 up to about 6. That's about what you can get to with packages like Sage, Topcom, Macaulay 2, basically nice computer al algebra packages for doing these kinds of things. Um, and then some of us and other people have pushed a little bit further in. But now, after some years of effort, we can do anything. It's all under control. Uh, we can study anywhere in this database. What we had to do was improve a whole bunch of algorithms, uh, as, as I'll mention. So bottom line is now, anywhere in the kreutzer skart list that you want to ask questions about the EFT, we're at least in a position to answer those questions geometry by geometry. On the other hand, the number of Calabia threefolds in here is not known. The number of polytopes is 473 million. But it could be that you know this one right here has 10 to the 80 distinct triangulations with distinct geometries arising from it. And no one knows yet how big those numbers are. So there's a lot waiting, and, and we should figure it out. How do you think about the number of triangulations no one's, no one's figured it out yet, actually. There's no theory that I'm aware of, that any of our friends are aware of, for um, counting, enumerating all triangulations, for um, Enumerating all the triangulations here uh, of a reflexive polytope, except in cases where um, an algorithm can actually enumerate all of them. That works up to H11 of 6. That's this thinnest line here. So up to here, you can tell Sage, give me all the triangulations, and it'll find you the 5 million triangulations of some polytope. And actually, that's how the triangulation specialized mathematicians study these things, that they write these packages in order to enumerate all of them. When the number is vast, I have no idea how to do it, and I don't know if we'll succeed. Not always, and you have to check. And that can also be intensive, checking that. There's also not a theory of that, no. Well, what you can do is you can see uh, if two different triangulations can be shown to give the same intersection numbers, then it's the same. And, um, but that's not straightforward in general. If the intersection numbers, you can sometimes prove, for example, that the second turn class is different, and then it's just a different thing. So yeah, there are some easy checks that they're different. Yes. Very good. That's exactly why everyone else was stuck for a long time. Because the one that's called a fine regular star triangulation, actually, let's proceed to this. What you need to do is um, you need to find a triangulation that has certain special properties. And it turns out that the existing packages found those special ones by enumerating all possible triangulations and looking for the special one. Uh, we just found a way to write down initially the fine regular star one. Uh, following a trick of Andreas Braun. So that makes it as easy to find a desirable triangulation as it is to find any triangulation. And as you can imagine from like computer graphics or something, it's not very hard to triangulate a polytope. What's hard is to triangulate a polytope and find one that fulfills these nice mathematical criteria that have nothing to do with, you know, rendering applications. So. Does that answer the question? No. Okay. So um, 
fine. So we, after a lot of work actually by us, we were able to compute the intersection numbers in Sage. For a caveat threefold of h11 of 100, it takes us, took us half an hour. Then um, our collaborator had an idea, and it took only, now it takes only 30 seconds. So we really cracked the intersection number problem for one geometry. And we can get, for example, all 653,000 threefolds with h11 up to 6 in a day. Um, and that was previously quoted as taking hundreds of thousands of hours um, in, in published work. But I mean, on a day on a laptop, I mean, we're not using anything serious here. Um, and we have yet to begin to actually use competent programming techniques or comp you know, sophisticated hardware or anything. All we're doing is fixing the underlying limitations of the mathematics going into the algorithm so far. OK, but we'll, we'll get there. So anyway, OK, we looked through some list of these things. We studied 2 million of them. Um, I, I can just sketch briefly what do we aim to get out of this kind of thing, and why are we interested especially in looking in the regime that was at the upper left at large h11. One reason is because it's there. Another reason is that that's where most of the triangulations are. And so that's where most of the geometries are. But another reason is you might think that at large h11, you can work in an expansion in 1 over h11, as in random matrix theory, and potentially have some understandable description that emerges from these statistics. OK, and um, so you know, just to flash some cartoons of cases where in the past we studied supergravity theories and small ensembles of Calabi outcome magnifications and argued that random matrix descriptions gave relatively useful uh, pictures of, for example, how the Hessian matrix, the kinetic matrix for axions, and the like behave. So this is just some heraldry. It's not really uh, systematic. It's nothing I want to describe to you systematically now. Now, the key limitation is weak coupling. So the topological data in the Kreutzer-Skarka list determines the EFT in the regime where the string coupling is small and the alpha prime expansion is valid. And this is true for any, almost any case where we begin with topological data and try and derive a four-dimensional field theory. You have to use perturbative methods. We'd love to know about things outside of this regime, but we can't get there yet, nor can anybody else. And so um, everything that I tell you in the remainder of the talk is going to hinge on requiring control of the alpha prime expansion. So I'm only going to work at large volume. And what the rest of the talk is about is, what does it really mean to be at large volume? OK, so now we have to talk about the Kähler cone and the Mori cone, which is how we keep track of whether things are big or small. Kähler cone is the set of cohomology classes of Kähler forms. So it's a cone in H11 of x. R, x is the threefold. And the Mori cone is its dual cone in H lower 2. Um, the Mori cone you can also think of as the set of two-dimensional homology classes that are realized by one-dimensional subvarieties, by complex manifolds of complex dimension 1. And these cones are dual in the sense that something is in the Kähler cone, a Kähler form J is in the Kähler cone if, when you integrate that Kähler form over any curve in the Mori cone, you get something non-negative. Okay, it's a non-negative pairing relationship. Um, if I take the set CA with A running up to some number, at least H11, to be the generators of the Mori cone, so a set of curves, then the condition that the Kähler form integrates to something bigger than, let's say, 2 pi squared alpha prime lambda with lambda a positive number implies that the actions of all world sheet instantons are at least, in our conventions, 2 pi lambda. We might take lambda to be 1, for example. So what we're doing here is we're trying to ask, when do I know that all, that everything's big enough that the alpha prime expansion is under good control. Well, one thing you could say is, I'm going to insist that every possible world sheet instanton has action at least 2 pi. So I get an e to the minus 2 pi contribution in the effective action. That's what we're going to do. That's our criterion. So um, we define now, I'm going to set alpha prime times 2 pi squared to 1 for the remainder. We define an object, the stretched Kähler cone, k tilde, which is the set of all Kähler forms such that when you integrate those Kähler forms over any curve, you get at least one, not just at least zero. In other words, it's a subspace of the space of Kähler forms such that no holomorphic curve has volume smaller than one. They all have volume at least one. So in pictures, um, in black is the Kähler cone, and inside, in cross-check, is the stretched Kähler cone. And the Mori cone generators are dual to the Kähler cone generators, so they point orthogonal to them and they push inward. This arrow just means if you were sitting here, there'd be some curve that has zero volume. If you move up to there, that curve has volume at least one. Here it would have volume at least two, et cetera. 
So the walls of the killer cone tell you where things go to zero volume. You want to stay away from the walls. Because if you're on the walls, you don't have any information about the EFT. Okay. Now, um, the key observation is that when H11 is large, this condition, that the integral of the Cato form is at least one, implies that some curves and divisors are really large. And so let me briefly show you how this phenomenon arises. Um, we have to go into some explicit setup for a second. So suppose omega i is a basis of curves, and ti is a set of Kähler parameters, the integrals of j over that basis. And suppose that I can write all of the curves, ca, as some matrix of integers dotted with the basis of curves. And then the condition that every holomorphic curve has volume at least lambda maps into here, the relationship that m dot t is at least lambda. Let's do an example. Um, it's a really simple phenomenon. I just have to illustrate it for you. Suppose I've got three curves that generate the Morricone, c1, c2, c3, and they have this relationship in terms of a basis, omega 1, omega 2, omega 1 minus 10, omega 2. Well, the condition that j integrates to at least 1 on all of them tells us that t1 is at least 1, t2 is at least 1, and t1 minus 10, t2 is at least 1. And you can solve that. There's a trivial solution, which is t1 is 11, t2 is 1. Now, I went into this saying, I'm going to insist that the integral over every curve is at least 1. But one of my killer parameters ended up much bigger than 1. It ended up being 11. This was a two-dimensional example. When you do this in higher dimensions, the more narrow the Kähler cone gets, meaning the more you have these kinds of mixed relationships like this here, uh, the farther out the stretched Kähler cone apex gets from the apex of the real Kähler cone. So note the blue here. As the Kähler cone gets more narrow, this thing goes out farther, which is just like the way scissors behave. You know, the, as the more narrow you make the thing, the farther the vertex where the blades meet goes from the origin. It's not, I did not call it a pizza wedge because it's open on the side, but yes, yeah, right. So this is the whole phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's a basic, it's a very stupid point that narrow, in a narrow cone, if you write an inset cone, the inset cone is much, is very far from the origin. And it turns out, now this is something which is not completely obvious, but it turns out that the Kähler cones that arise in Calabi compactifications with H11 large are in fact very narrow in this sense. And so everything I tell you is then going to be driven by the fact that within the stretched Kähler cone, within the region of control of the alpha ram expansion, the, the Kähler form is really far from the origin. The Kähler form is big, which means that some curves are just really big. You didn't want them necessarily to be big. You would have been happy saying that every curve has volume just one. You can't get that. Some of them have to be numerically a lot bigger than one, just because of this sort of stacking set of linear relationships. So as, a, as an example, just to see concretely, here's this matrix M. So this is a case where H11 is 5, and expanded in some basis. And then here's a set of each row is a curve expanded in that basis. And you work out the volumes of divisors, four cycles in this case, and you find the volumes are some reasonable thing, 3, 5, 10, 100. That's what you might have expected based on saying that every curve should have volume at least 1. But then, oops, you find that one divisor has to have volume at least 5702 with, with this data just from the structure of the cone. Now, could you have said, I want every volume to be at least two? Yeah, sure you could. Then this thing would go up by a factor of four. Okay, you can set where you put the bounds, but you can't change the fact that there's a huge hierarchy in divisor volume. Oh, sorry, these are divisors, not curves. I switched things on you. I impose the conditions on the curves. It's certainly true that at least one holomorphic curve will have volume one, but divisors, no. Divisors are different. I don't think it's a Kalabiyev thing. I think it's a, um, it's a, it's as simple as um, if you have a bunch of linear inequalities, not equalities, and you try and simultaneously fulfill all of them, they won't all be saturated. That's all. So you had some. Let's say we had the first quadrant is what you you wonder if the if the first if the Kähler cone can fulfill the, can be the first quadrant, and you have some some region like this. So this is, this is the Kähler cone. Um, you're trying to fulfill two inequalities. One is that you're above this line. The other is that you're to the right of this line. Um, and if, they're, if you're writing these conditions as such and such thing greater than or equal to 0, then you always include the origin. Once you make it greater than or equal to 1, 
you're drawing you're going to draw a different plane like that and you want to study the region inside there now if you intersect a whole lot of hyperplanes that are shifted away from the origin when the number of them gets large the vertex of them does not stay near the origin it tends to move out that's just a fact about linear inequalities not about like Kähler geometry I don't know if this applies to anything that's not Kähler because I'm crucially using the condition the fact that I can map the control of the alpha prime expansion onto um, the integral of a two form over a basis of two cycles gives me some linear inequalities for a not manifold that's not Kähler you know you have many different ways of specifying that it's big enough and I don't know that any of them is necessarily like this so yeah that's an interesting interesting question I, I might at the end get back to other reasons to doubt um, whether it's sufficient to insist that every curve has volume at least one okay, yeah No, it guarantees that all holomorphic instanton contributions are small. Because I'm insisting that every calibrated manifold, every manifold calibrated by the Kähler form has volume at least one. Well, two pi. Action, volume at least one, action at least two pi. That guarantees that every possible contribution to the superpotential or prepotential, if we had n equals two, is suppressed. What you don't know is what about classes that don't have any calibrated representatives in them? And this is something that I'm really really concerned about I'd be happy to talk about afterward I think we don't really know as I certainly don't know a way of specifying sufficient conditions for the alpha prime expansion to be under control in a compactification on a Kähler manifold I can specify this and that tells me that all super potential corrections are under control but what if there's some class um, that has no holomorphic representative then its volume is not determined by integrating J over anything okay so the Yes, please. Th th that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so, are there unsuppressed killer potential instantons? Are there unsuppressed, less even less supersymmetric things? Um, hard to say. It's really hard to say. But at least this is a necessary condition for a super potential one. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I've got like seven minutes or something. Okay. Um, Okay, let me skip over the fact that we can't really compute what the Kähler cone is. We can compute an approximation to the Kähler cone. Um, and if you're curious about that, you can ask me. Um, so what do we find? We find narrow cones, as I was mentioning already, which give rise to large cycles. They give rise to large cycles because the Kähler cone gets pushed out from the origin. So first of all, the walls of the Kähler cone are nearly parallel. If Back in this same diagram, if I define theta to be this angle here, basically this opening angle, what you find is, um, here's a histogram versus H11 from some subset of our study, um, you know, all the way up to 491, of the cosine of that angle, theta, and you see it's pretty heavily peaked at uh, values around minus one. This angle, this angle is, um, this line is normal to the upper wall, and this one is normal to the, uh, to the lower wall. So it is, it is the, the angle in the wedge, too. In other words, it's the question, um, if I pick, so I've got some cone which got lots of walls. It's an H11 dimensional cone with many more than H11 walls. Pick the pair that's closest to back to back and find the angle between them. The angle's not gonna be exactly zero, but it could be close. And we see it's actually quite close to zero. Okay. So these things are really squashed, the cones are. First of all that, the stretched Kähler cone is far from the origin, so we can measure d min, the distance from the origin to this apex here, and here's uh, a swordfish plot of the log base 10 of that distance versus H11. Okay. And you see, um, well, this distance is a really big distance. It's like 10 to the 5, okay. inappropriate unit. The intersection numbers. Okay, so I didn't talk about um, models for the intersection numbers yet. Nobody had data on intersection numbers on threefolds with large H11, bigger than about 5 or 8 or something like that. Um, the intersection numbers are pretty sparse. So here, the number of non-vanishing ones in an appropriately chosen basis is only is less than 10 times uh, H11. H11 cubed of them could have been non-vanishing a priori, but they're mostly not. Well, that's pretty obvious from these kinds of pictures. If you've got some big polytope with 
um, points all over the place. Many points are so far from other points that they're not connected by any edges. And so they're vanishing intersection numbers. Um, it says that certain kinds of couplings in the Kähler potential at least are weak. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Mixing terms and things like that. Yeah, correct. The intersection numbers are sparse and they're of order one. They don't get super big. Well, once in a while they get of order like 80 or something. But they're typically of order five or 10. The like, Calabi-L volume is large. So this is log base 10 of the threefold volume, and it's big. It's like 10 to the 10 or something like that. This only goes up to H11 of 100. It would get much bigger if I took it out to 491. The divisors are also big. So now, um, let me take a basis of H4 and compute the volume of every element of that basis. There are H11 elements in the basis. And I'm going to sort those from tau1, the smallest, up to tau last, the biggest one. And I'll show you tau last. Tau last has volume, again, you know, typically like 10 to the 5 or something. But the instanton action, the action for a Euclidean D3 brain wrapping one of these divisors is e to the minus 2 pi that volume. And so an axion that gets a mass only from such a Euclidean D3 brain has a mass that's bounded above by e to the minus 2 pi tau last. The reason I specified a basis is think about the H11 axion and H11 basis elements. Um, if I've given you only H11 minus one of the basis elements and given you an instanton on each of those, there's going to be a massless axion. There's one linear combination of the axion fields that's not given any potential whatsoever. If I now add one more basis element, one more divisor, and put a Euclidean brain on it, and it has volume, some volume tau last, well, the last axion that was massless before now gets a mass, but its mass is e to the minus two pi tau last. It's interesting because um, the red line here is mass equals 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. So above this line, every dot above this line is a Calabi-Yau, which necessarily has at least one axion with mass smaller than present day Hubble. Or the alpha prime expansion is out of control. Right, so let's say, you know, take this geometry. Either some curves are much smaller than volume one, or Curves are all volume at least one, but then uh, there's a massless axion. Yes? They would get monotony, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's going to be pretty dilute flux if the volume is 10 to the 10. So it's an interesting question how it'll change. Yeah. We didn't check that yet. Um, you know, a lot of things scale in a pretty dilute way once you make everything so big as that. Um, but we'll see. We, 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 we should test. So, um, now look, the caveat about this is all of this was driven by uh, assuming control of the alpha prime expansion. And as Murdad was asking, um, you know, are, are there other instanton corrections? Well, we don't know, uh, but it'll be, it'll be worth figuring that out. Um, now, also, the axion fundamental domain, r, the radius of the fundamental domain, in Planck mass units, reduced Planck mass units, is small. So this is radius equals m Planck, reduced Planck mass here. And they're just small. This is in the region, in the most restrictive region in the Kähler cone. Actually, um, this is the place where my hesitation about whether I can really compute the Kähler cones correctly comes in. There are two ways of trying to compute the Kähler cones. One is to make a very restrictive model based on using the generators of the Kähler cone of the ambient toric variety. And the least restrictive thing to do is to take the generators of a subset of the curves inside x, the threefold itself. And in between those two is the right answer, the Kähler cone of x itself. So the most narrow cone is the Kähler cone of the ambient variety. The broadest one is the one written k intersect. And then the true answer is in between. What we've done is compute the answer for the narrow and broad one and sandwich the right answer in between them. What I show you here is the axion fundamental domain if I take a very narrow Kähler cone. Remember, if I take a narrow Kähler cone, the vertex, the apex of the stretched Kähler cone moves out far. Everything gets big. If I take the cone to be, Kähler cone to be too narrow, that effect is accentuated and exaggerated. And the right answer might be that things can be just a little bit more relaxed, a little bit smaller. So now you might ask, well, what if I were to take this less restrictive model of the Kähler cone? It'll allow things to be a little smaller. And indeed, we find that there can be axion field spaces that are as big as 10 to the 4 and Planck. Now, I, I don't trust them. I think probably in these cases the alpha prime expansion will really be out of control when we can correctly compute the Kähler metric. But I don't know. To, to be updated in a year or two once we get this sorted out. Okay. 
OK, so what are implications? You have to choose. Uh, in this ensemble, in the kreutzer skark ensemble, you have to choose either to tolerate alpha prime correction or to tolerate massless axions or to work in this thin fringe where h11 is small. Um, this is going to be interesting for moduli stabilization. Another useful remark is many couplings are controlled by the volume, and it would be fun to search our data for outliers with anomalously small volume, and so anomalously large decay constants, as in the case that I, I showed on the previous slide. Correct, correct. Yeah, this, is, this, this will be fun. What we'll need to do is figure out, can we tolerate just a few special cycles can be small and everything's under good control? Or can you take, in fact, almost all of the H11 or few times H11 cycles to be small? That's what's a little bit less clear. But, um, but we should try to, to work in that regime. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's something that, um, that we're thinking about, but we don't have any progress on yet. OK, so cosmological constraints, I'm not going to say anything about it because we haven't concluded anything. Um, you know, you could think that you could get constraints from couplings to the standard model, from moduli decays to dark radiation, or black hole super radiance. But um, at least for these prior points, you have to specify the realization of the standard model and the non-thermal history and how things get reheated. So that's fun future work, but it's not something that you can immediately conclude as a constraint on this scenario until you build in more things. So I won't, I won't comment about that. Um, so let me conclude. Uh, we constructed a landscape of Calabi-L threefold hypersurfaces, two million threefolds with H11 up to the biggest one in the list, 491. Um, and we can now study any geometry in the kreutzer skark list in, in a few seconds. This is a step toward the goal of constructing a large ensemble of solutions of string theory by stabilizing moduli in these geometries. I didn't tell you much about the actual the computation of which instantons contribute. Um, we have results on that. We've spent most of our effort on that. Um, but that, too, is still a work in progress. It'll be a year, at least, before we can really nail down which instantons contribute to the super potential. Which instantons contribute to the killer potential, that's even further ahead. So we can use these um, solutions as a way to test ideas about quantum gravity effective theories and possibly reject certain premature conjectures and confirm other conjectures or something like that. Um, and when the curvature expansion is under control, what we find is many cycles are really large. The threefold volume goes like H11 to the fifth and some axions are essentially massless. Thank you.